And we're back and we're moving into our first conversation this morning. We're doing a check-in with the Rural Development Department. And joining us this morning, we have Ernest Banner, who is the coordinator of rural development in the Ministry of Labor, Local Government, and Rural Development. Good morning, Good morning and thank you for being here. Good morning, television viewers. All right, so we're going to be talking a bit about the work of rural development and uh, especially uh, about rural water systems. So let me just start off with an overview of the work of the department itself. We worked with the 195 village councils, the 78 alcaldes, and the 115 water boards in the country. Mm -hmm. We mainly focus on governance. Mm -hmm. However, there are other issues that we are looking at in terms of social and economic issues in the rural areas of Belize. Mm -hmm. And when you say you work specifically with these villages, is it about ensuring access or equitable access? It's ensuring that there's an improved water source to these villages. In 2000, when the government signed on to the MDGs, mm -hmm. they signed on as a MDG plus country, meaning we are supposed to provide improve water source to all Belizeans. Mm -hmm. It simply means if you are getting water from an open source and we put a borehole and put a hand pump, you have an improved source. Mm -hmm. But the government went beyond that mm -hmm. and they have invested some $30, 30 million dollars in ensuring that there's water systems in majority of these villages. Okay. There are 115 water systems, rural water systems in the country serving 132 villages. Mm -hmm. Then we have about 42 villages that are served by the BWSL company. Yeah. So we are, and then you have the other 25, 20 to 25 villages that have hand pumps. Mm -hmm. So we have exceeded the expectation we are at about 95% improved water source. And what about coverage across the country? What are we in terms of percentage? Uh, in terms of percentage, I said we are about 95, 96%. 95. And the places that have not been able to, to be connected to a direct water source would um, be where? We, we have one up north, uh, about one west, mm -hmm. and the majority about 17 are down south in the Toledo district. Okay. For the most part, it's finding a reliable water source. Mm -hmm. And once we find a reliable water source, the government more than likely will invest in putting a water system. Mm -hmm. we're, we're joined at this time uh, by the CEO in the Ministry of Local Government, uh, Labor, Local Government and Rural Development, Sharon Young. And it's a great time to bring you into the conversation. Thank you for being here as well. So, CEO, you know, we're, we're kind of setting the overview of the work specifically of the Department of Rural Development and uh, being able to ensure that everyone has access to water. Talk to me about how this is a priority uh, in the ministry. Sure. Morning, um, Marlene. Morning, Mr. Banner. Good morning, um, TV listeners. Um, well, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Um, water has become, um, or has always been, um, a priority for the government and um, especially for the mandate of the ministry responsible for rural development and in the order of priority it's right at the top yeah. we are expected to deliver or at least to ensure that every single Belizean have access to improved water systems mm. or an, an improved water source and um, we've been working over the years with several development partners mm. Um, the way the water systems are managed, or at least water distribution is managed in the country, it's either through BWSL as a service provider or the rudimentary water systems managed by the village water boards. Yeah. Um, we've looked at various assessments um, done by IDB, UNDP, um, and the like, and we've seen that um, in terms of coverage, BWSL, according to the last study by IDB in 2013, um, was providing water to at least 57% of the population mm -hmm. and then the rudimentary water systems through the village water boards were reaching about 33% of the population at that time. Mm -hmm. We um, are com comfortable that that has increased in terms of our reach to the rural water systems and the communities. Um, the issue we have right now in our department is actually finding water source. Um, through the traditional uh, method that we've been using, which is the 
um, wells, mm -hmm. finding groundwater source to provide um, water to homes. And so our team has been working, and especially during this time of the year, during the dry, um, that seems to be the crisis point mm -hmm. for many communities. Um, and we have been looking at other options other than well, um, mm -hmm. perhaps looking at filtration systems, mm -hmm. abstracting water directly from the river. Um, the reality is that it's going to take a, t a long time, meaning medium to long term, mm -hmm. to get these communities if and, and when um, the conversation will be had on whether we transition all communities to BWSL and the cost of that. Mm -hmm. That's a live discussion that has to continue. But until that time, the work of the Rural Development Department is to ensure that there is a steady supply of water to these communities. Mm -hmm. Mr. Banner alluded to the cost. Mm -hmm. um, just in rehabilitating these rudimentary systems, which some of them have been in place for decades, mm -hmm. and he could give you the history of, of most of them, or yeah. all of them, um, but we have estimated that since 1997, we've spent over $30 million from the government's budget to rehabilitate water systems, putting in place new pumps, pipes, um, running systems to homes. Recently, we've started to try and implement um, uh, in communities that are vulnerable and have no access to BWSL or other alternative, we've, we've put in place some water tanks, mm -hmm. fill those with water, so try to get water um, st and that steady supply of water to these communities. But it is the critical issue now. Yeah. Um, it's at the point where the cost to actually getting water um, to homes yeah. are, have increased incrementally. You know, globally, when we, when we hear people talk about issues of, of water scarcity, it's something that is, is very difficult to resonate with people who live in a country like Belize, where we have water all around us. Yeah. And the assumption is that there is enough and sufficient yeah. flow that will be fine for a very long time. Yeah. When you are in a period like we are now, which is the, the dry sure. season, nearing the end of the dry season, um, where do you see the, the real examples of where uh, conserving water and being conscious of water sources are, are a clear reality? Well, in all the, the villages, we found out that the, the water level drops yeah. mm -hmm. during this period. And it's very critical that rural people start to conserve water. Yeah. Um, we have areas such as near Belmopan, Armenia, mm -hmm. where we were in an almost crisis situation. It's difficult to find the, the groundwater there. However, during this dry season, it gets worse. And in some instances, we have to be chucking in water. And it, it, it's several things. The water source is one, the, because we tried to find groundwater mm -hmm. that is better in terms of pumping into a tank and just treat basic treatment and distribute. Mm -hmm. However, the way that the, these projects go about their people demand. Mm -hmm. So we usually consult the people and if the people, they say, listen, that's not our priority, we don't want that, then we have to move on. Mm -hmm. I could recall that specific example, we went there and we consulted with the people to connect to BWSL and they were adamant they don't want to connect to BWSL. Why would that be the case? Because from the minute you said Armenia, I'm just thinking that's a fringe mm -hmm. community. Yes. It's so close to, to the capital city. Yes. Um, people have the perception of when they hear BWSL, they think huge bills. Uh -huh. And so we have to work on that perception to show them that in some cases, it's cheaper than you have in your rudimentary water system. Because mm -hmm. um, people sell water in these villages five ten dollars a drum mm -hmm. so it reaches that situation where it costs you more during this time mm -hmm. to to get your water and if you had a pipe water into your yard it would have been cheaper mm -hmm. so we have situation like those where we're having challenges with finding reliable water source mm -hmm. then we have situations where the water comes directly from the river mm -hmm. and that poses another challenge Yes, during the dry, you have your water, but when it floods, what happened? Mm -hmm. You get the same water that is flowing, you get that. And so it creates that challenge where we are looking at how we can use the water that is there to make it pure, 
yeah. and portable for the people. Yeah. And that's what we are working on. Yeah, what, just adding to that, the, the consultations are very important um, in these communities. And as Mr. Bana uh, mentioned, um, the deci final decision um, is hinged upon what comes out of those consultations. What we found um, in some of those communities that um, relies on their own rudimentary water systems and are near to urban areas that can easily connect um, is that when they refuse, um, we would have to then intervene to truck in these wa yes. the, the water that, that they need. Um, some of the concerns we have with that is the um, quality of the water that they get, um, the steady supply, mm -hmm. making sure that they have what they need, um, rationing of water then becomes mm -hmm. an issue for them. Mm -hmm. So there are many reasons um, that we prefer that, that a system is in place that can provide a steady supply, whether that is a BD BWSL connected mm -hmm. water system or a rudimentary system that is sourcing water from a, um, a, a reliable source. source right? um, we, we have also discussed in the case of we are having a, an issue right now in bullet tree um, and just as a backdrop to all of this, a lot of these projects and these rudimentary water systems are financed through loans, yeah. either through um, SIF from CDB in most instances. Um, and so we have two projects in the pipeline right now, one for the village of Bullet Tree. Mm -hmm. um, and one for the Boston. village of Boston that's and already in place. Right. Yeah. And then the other one for Libertad Concepcion in mm -hmm. the north. Um, and so again, the consultations will determine how yeah. fast we move forward with these projects, when they come on stream, mm -hmm. um, because they're tied to these project deadlines. So um, if we're able to advance consultations in a way that moves towards um, putting in place systems that allow for us either to source water from the river or from a well. In the case of Bullet Tree, we're having some significant challenges finding water sources. So we, we've been looking at various systems and it, it's a challenge in all aspects of it. So, so let's understand more of the Bullet Tree issue because they're next to the river. And again, another mm. community that is fairly close uh, to an urban center. Yes. So what is the issue there? The issue is that we have an open source. They get water from the river. Okay. Um, the basic treatment, the, the pump is directly in the river. Mm -hmm. So whatsoever it is in the river, you get. If somebody is washing upstream, that's what you get. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the basic treatment is chlorinate the water. Mm -hmm. yeah. When it floods, they get that water as well. They still use the water when it floods? Yes. That's, that's the they, source, they have yeah. to continue to pump water mm -hmm. and the water goes into a tank, settles a little while and then it's pumped to the community. Mm -hmm. uh, BWSL is about a mile, a mile and a half mm -hmm. away. However, we are trying to find another source that is better than the river. Mm -hmm. We have drilled about six wells over 1,500 feet already total. Mm -hmm. and we are finding out that the soil type remains the same. Mm -hmm. There's limited amount of water. Mm -hmm. So we are at this point where we have to look, do we use a filtration system to improve on the, the water from the river or do we connect to BWSL? But as I said, these are people driven. Yeah. So yeah. we have to meet so with the people. So the community to has to agree yeah. has that to they agree. would want to tap into BWSL. And, yes. Yeah. At, the tail, yeah, at the tail end of all of this, why it's important for the communities to agree is who then pay. Yeah. Yes. You start talking about the payment for the actual management of the system. It yeah. costs to filter water, it costs to abstract water, it costs to distribute water to homes. Yeah. So, if, so it, essentially these rudimentary water centers are supposed to pay for themselves. Mm -hmm. right? So that's the conversation that, that's important in the community. Yeah. That's now, when we think of river water, you know, um, you clearly talked about, you know, people cleaning, washing clothes or cleaning. I mean, we've seen people cleaning cars by the riverside. Um, but what are the other other hazards that are associated with extracting directly from the river? Um, as I said, whatsoever is in the river you get. Uh -huh. if, mm. a, if there's an animal that dies in the river and it's floating past, you mm. pump that as well. And we know what can be the effects of all these. You can yeah. have different sicknesses that you could get from these. Yeah. And that's the danger of getting water from directly from these sources. Bullet tree is only one mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we have about 12 of these systems that get water directly from either a spring or a river. Mm -hmm. And so 
we have to find new ways of, if that's the only water that is available, we have to see how we can treat it to make it pure. Mm -hmm. And that's the point where we are at right now. How do we treat them and, yeah. and cost implication? Because mm -hmm. the more treatment you put in, mm -hmm. the higher the cost to provide. Yeah. So we have to look at all those. The other major issue we've, we've seen over the years, and this is from my history with lands, is that of land management and land use. Yeah. Land use play a critical role in the quality of water. Mm -hmm. Communities that um, straddle farms, huge farms, are impacted by land use. So we, we have to find a way to integrate the distribution of land, the decision to distribute land, and for the purpose of distribution, that, that then affects water systems and water source. Yeah. Um, and in the discussion with the Ministry of Natural Resources in the preparation of the National Land Use Policy that's mm -hmm. supposed to come on stream at some point this year, um, should help to guide how people use land. Of course, enforcement then becomes yeah. a critical issue in that. Who enforces land use issues? Whether it's Department of Environment, it straddles across many different departments, public health, mm -hmm. their role. And so the communities management of their water systems are important because yes. they'll be the watchdogs yeah. for their own water quality system. Yeah. For the most part, these, these communities manage the system. It's a local yeah. water board. So even that they think about when BWSL is coming in. Mm. That hey, we, we will not have control again. Yeah, you have a committee and from the community. A committee from yeah. the com community that manages this thing. Mm. But when it comes to treating water, we have situations where majority of these systems are not using treatment for this water. Well, that's been my burning question. What's the collaboration with the Ministry of Health? Clearly, you have to ensure that whatever is being pumped into the homes, if it's to drink or to, to use to bathe your baby, it mm. has to be healthy and safe. The Ministry of Health monitors all water systems, yeah. even all water suppliers on a monthly basis. So we would receive information when there's a positive result yeah. that in this village we find that there's E. coli, so we need to take action. So we have that relationship. We even the develop a training manual mm -hmm. in treating water. How do we treat water and the importance of treating water? Mm -hmm. One of the issues is that you have locals, villagers who believe that chlorine, they have that perception chlorine causes certain ailments, mm -hmm. for example, cancer. And, and they have that, so we have to see how we could educate them to yeah. that. It's not the chlorine that causes that, but it could be different things. So there's so, a fear as well. Yeah. Yes, there's that fear. Uh, out of the 115, we did a study and only 44 were chlorinating their mm. water, okay. were treating their water. But they are supposed to as a part of their treatment yes, mechanism. they're supposed to, to, to treat the water. When these systems come in place, the, there's a chlorinator that is provided and there's training on how you use it and the importance of it. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, it started off very good. They're chlorinating and along the line, then they dropped off and people start to pressure them that they don't like the taste of the water and then they don't chlorinate. So we have issues like that as well. Yeah. There are two things I, I, I want to just reiterate. One is the, in terms of collaboration, the response mm -hmm. that we get from our other government departments, sister agencies. Response is always timely. The response is always um, very good um, and, and invite and, and welcoming by the different agencies. For example, Ministry of Health, Department of Environment. If there's an issue and their, their intervention is needed, yeah. they're always there to respond. The other uh, issue that, that, that we really have to address um, in this year, and we've talked about it, is the governance of the water yes. boards. That has been plaguing water management in these rural systems for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And there are many things that we can talk about in terms of governance, but the core to it is just the capacity of the water boards to execute yeah. their responsibilities. Yeah. Um, and that, that is tied to many different factors, including how they are appointed and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but definitely we've seen that, um, that that the that the uh, in those systems in those communities where people ha are expected to pay for water, mm -hmm. that has been one of the fundamental problems of these water systems. Users um, are reluctant to pay for mm. water systems for whatever reason. They are reluctant to pay. Um, at some point in time, there will have to be some stricter 
uh, rules mm -hmm. governing the use and the, and the payment for the use of these services mm -hmm. because it, it is becoming a greater challenge for government to make sure that these water water yeah. systems are maintained. That will be a tougher consultation because going from not paying for, sport, for a resource to paying for it mm -hmm. um, clearly won't be an easy sell. Mm -hmm. But I, I want to come back before we move into the water boards just to talk more about um, interministerial collaboration because I'm sure another important partner would be the Ministry of Agriculture. For yeah. example, when we speak with the Department of Environment, we speak of uh, the issues with wastewater runoff into uh, our, our water, well, waterways and essentially yeah. water sources from what you're telling me. So what is the collaboration like? You're talking about where people who will either drink or use uh, water from uh, natural sources um, what you're trying to work with them there, but there are other contaminants that may be coming in from either people in their own community or from themselves and using uh, whatever it is on their farm. The, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> there was a side there. This is one of the challenges. Um, the, the cooperation and the collaboration with the ministries are um, very engaging, yeah. you're very close um, in dealing with immediate responses to, to issues that come about. Yeah. There has to be a much more strategic approach to dealing with water use. Yeah. Um, there are multiple uses mm -hmm. for land and water, and obviously everything that happens on land. People, we've seen, for example, in the south, mm -hmm. where water is much more available and abundant than in the north, um, where um, banana and citrus farms and the activities there mm -hmm. definitely affect the water source. Um, and so the management of the water in the, in the rivers is especially and the farms and the activities on those farms are important. Ministry of Education, uh, sorry, Ministry of Agriculture has started or have um, put in place a database mm -hmm. of agricultural, agriculture farms and we've been involved in that database because we need to know where these farms are. We need to know how they are impacting communities. Mm -hmm. Most often the reporting on the use and the um, activities, agricultural activities come right out of the communities. They tell us, you know, mm -hmm. this farm, um, activity they are seeing. This. So it, it, it's that kind of um, circular relationship that, yeah. that's ongoing. At a more strategic level, though, we need to we need to look at things like drought response, yeah, a drought management plan. What happens in yeah. the dry season, especially in the north, yeah. which use comes first? In practice, it has always been domestic and residential use for water comes forth first before commercial use. Mm -hmm. um, there's in addition to agriculture, there's also the tourism sector mm -hmm. that that heavily uses water mm -hmm. in the resort industry. Um, so. The, the, a much more strategic discussion yeah. and approach to these activities have to be dealt with. At the technical level, I can tell you it is ad hoc. Mm -hmm. It is when something arises and we have a discussion. But we um, resources and all of these constraints aside, yeah. there has to be a much more longer, medium to longer term approach at dealing with our activities that affect water. Yeah. But that's the importance of the National Integrated Water Resource Authority mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that controls water obstruction, drilling and all those. So uh, that authority plays a critical role. It goes beyond agriculture. That authority should be that body that looks at the water resource management of the country. Mm -hmm. And so that authority is the authority, at this time it's not in place, but the unit, the hydrology unit, mm -hmm. is, that, is a unit that looks at water obstruction and what's happening upstream and mm -hmm. all those things, mm -hmm. protecting the water resources. Yeah. So in terms of that coordinating body, that uh, National Integrated Water Authority should be that body that also polices these things. Mm -hmm. so, we, we have the, the structures in place, it's just getting it to work. Yeah. Now, what I hear from you is, is being able to work towards what would be 100% access. You're at 9 to 5, which is fairly close, but also modernizing some of the systems that are already in place. Uh, you speak of consultations in, in trying to get people on board, those who are close enough to get on the BWSL system. But I'd imagine the long-term goal is to really get a rollout as far as you can in as many communities. Wouldn't that be the case? Um, there, there have been studies, I was wondering if you were watching the study that I that recently did, 
in terms of uh, through the BCIF mm -hmm. that looks at modernization of these things. Yeah. But it's beyond BWSL yeah. as well. Because what is put in place is a rudimentary system. Mm -hmm. We pump water up and then the, water, the pressure yes. gives, comes down. And they have recommended that we look at different technology in providing water. Mm -hmm. And we are trying that, well, we'll be trying that in Hopkins, mm -hmm. where we'll use, instead of just pump, pumping up mm -hmm. to get the uh, pressure, we we'll look at a variable speed drive pump. But it also, you have to think about the capacity to manage these as well. Mm -hmm. So, yes, we are looking at how we can modernize. Also, in case of BWSL, as I said, it's a, it's a tricky situation because you don't want to go into the rural area until BWSL is coming because they, they feel like it's high bills and whatsoever comes with BWSL. But you said there's a, there's a level of education that yes. takes place even in talking about chlorine use because what, what I'm hearing is, and, and it seems to be working with the communities where they are, but it, it's almost uh, staying at that first step when you know there's a long-term goal. A developing country as we are wants to be more developed and a more developed nation has water access to a source like BWS as, in as far a reach as possible. The, uh, of course, the long-term goal is to, whether in the previous note I made, there mm -hmm. has to, there's a live discussion as to whether or not there's a poli deci policy decision to be taken yeah. for BWSL to, or for water systems to transition to, a, yeah. to BWSL. That has to, has that discussion has to happen yeah. because of the cost involved. If you think yeah. of where the communities are located, and we did a map, he, he's been pinpointing each yeah. area that we put in place systems. But if you look at how these communities are spread yeah. throughout the country, the cost to connect yeah. each and every community would be significantly yeah. high. Yeah. So that will have to be part of the discussion, how much it will cost. And if we are going to transition to that source mm -hmm. um, or that service provider, how it impacts then uh, from a legal standpoint, the, the, the whole village council system or village governance system where you have village water boards that mm -hmm. has long been a tradition and part of our government governance structure. Yeah. So it's a two part discussion in addition to the local issues of, oh, it's going to be expensive if you connect to BWSL, but the two part, it's, it ought to be part of the long-term strategy discussion, mm -hmm. um, framing it in the context of there has to be a steady supply of potable water from uh, a mm -hmm. service provider that is able to um, put in place modern systems yeah. for communities. In the context of Belize, that's a complex dis discussion because of um, location of these villages mm -hmm. and terrain, how much it's going to cost, those are the kinds of things that yeah. will have to be involved in that discussion. But obviously, the yeah. long term goal is to make sure that each and every Belizean in every community mm -hmm. have access to a steady supply of potable yeah. water. That's the in, objective. In 2012, I did a, a study on all these rudimentary water systems looking at can we put a better management system in place? Um, and out of that came the idea of maybe we have to start to regionalize, put yeah. regionalized management. Mm -hmm. For example, you'll have your, your old northern road. Instead of having three, four water Individual boards, you have page. one water board. Mm -hmm. And that, it, it gives you a critical mass yeah. to generate enough revenue to supply the water that is necessary. So that study shows if we do that, there's that possibility you'll have better management, better yeah. water quality. Yeah. In terms of the overall revenue of these 115 water boards, we're looking at $4.1 million per year. Mm. And in expenses, 2.2. So you have an excess of $1.9 million. Mm -hmm. And that's considering the payment rate is only 63%. Mm -hmm. So the possibility is there that we can look at regionalizing the management as well. Mm. Because Location might be a problem for you to connect to the main BWSL grid. Yeah. But we can regionalize the management yeah. to have critical mass to generate enough revenue to provide the quality of water that the rural people the, deserve. The, 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 that point is important because m so there are parts of the country where in regions, as we mm -hmm. say, s several communities source water from the same 
area yeah. from the same source. So if you have three, four communities accessing water from the same source with yes. three different management boards, mm -hmm. then that's where you have very difficult, my, my officers are in a very difficult position where they're, they have to be managing and working with three or four different water boards accessing water from the same source. And so that has been also a consideration as a yeah. transitioning or an interim yeah. arrangement in the medium to long term as we move towards a greater um, Is that a possibility system. though? Because what I'm hearing it from you have. is that um, a part of the issue uh, that is being said but not really said is that there's a self-governance that, that yes. uh, communities want. And sometimes, even though it's my neighbor village, that doesn't mean I want to relinquish that <laughs> control to yes. another. It's, it's an identity thing as well. Mm -hmm. it's my, they, they take it as mine. And now you want me to supply water to my neighbor. And I can't do it. I remember we, have a we had a situation in Big Falls. Silver Creek was about five pipelines away. Mm -hmm. And we met with them to say, listen, we need to connect so Big Falls can get water. And there was that problem that we can't do that. What about our water source? It will deplete our water source and all of that. So yeah. it's a back and forth in terms of that. But in terms of what uh, CEO said, we have to start to look at those that are getting water from the same source. Yeah. And we have started that al already. If you are getting water from the same source and it's two villages, we put one, one management yeah. because it's the same system. Yeah. Yesterday I was down south because we we're in the process of putting our water system for Hummingbird Middlesex. Mm -hmm. It's one water system and these people are still thinking, oh, it's my part, it's your part. <laughs> and so yeah. we had meetings to show them the benefits of having one water system. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have to so look at. So the regional at. system is something you're, you're incrementally working yes, towards. Yes, we are looking at the, the easier ones that you have one water source, one water system. And the cooperation and willingness from the communities. And, and yeah. we put one management yeah. structure. And you place. train everyone on board as well. Yes, mm -hmm. there's a health component in yeah. terms of training. Ministry of Health goes in, there's that training. Then there's a management component mm -hmm. and the, the financial management and all of those because these boards have to be accountable to the government. They are appointed by the minister. They are, mm -hmm. they are representing the government in these communities. Mm -hmm. So they have to account first to the government. However, there is also the concern that people are saying, we don't know what's happening, we, we are paying, we don't know what's mm -hmm. happening to our money. And we have some good practices where pe the boards meet with the communities on an annual basis to update them as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are put in place to ensure that there's proper management. But there's that mistrust if, if you are collecting my money and I don't know what you are doing, then I start to have my own perception. Especially I see you buy a new vehicle. I don't know how you get it, but you are collecting my money. And so yeah. I keep on telling these boards that you need to meet with the people, be open with them, show them Report exactly finances, what finances. Yeah. Yes, what you but collect, are these, what are, are your plans. Are these stipulations plan? that are in place? Yeah, or? on our part, we the ministry, through the department will have to be a bit more uh, proactive mm -hmm. in overseeing yeah. these activities of these water boards and yeah. we've been meeting with several challenges over the maybe since I've been there over the last few months but probably even before um, but it means that we will have to do our part too mm -hmm. to, to expect better accounting better accountability and transparency mm -hmm. from these bodies and uh, because they have as he said a responsibility on behalf of the government yeah. to um, be open and transparent with their communities as to yeah. what it is they're doing with, with, with the man management of the board now see you correct me if I'm wrong but wouldn't these both be issues on the on your, uh, this ministry's portfolio given that local government is also a part of the ministry as well yes in ensuring that people who are elected or appointed to be a part of the board are carrying out their mandate as they should yes Definitely. Um, village councils are part of the whole local yes. governance structure in, in mm -hmm. our country. Um, and water board is a sub, sub, subset of that. Um, so definitely that is um, a, 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 a function mm -hmm. that we will be consciously as a ministry yeah. um, executing going forward, meaning that we will now require 
even greater transparency and accountability from village councils. And timely because we have council elections coming up in the next few months, mm -hmm. there will be um, a need for us to start training all over again, whoever the, the councils are, mm -hmm. um, and selection of new water boards. And it will be time for us to renew our requests and our commitments and our demands yeah. from these councils and these local bodies. Um, then you, you have to realize that these boards are volunteers. They don't get paid to do it. Even the village council, it's just a stipend they receive. Mm -hmm. yeah. I always tell them it's 200 shillings you get per month <laughs> to do what you do. It's only a $50 stipend. So we, we have to have that in But while back the appeal of our isn't financial, well. sometimes the appeal may be being a leader yes. or having yes. that, that uh, power to be able to make decisions. Yeah. That, that's what I found out with the water boards. The guy telling, listen, you don't get pay. Your pay is seeing that your people have water. Yeah. Mm. And you'll get that when you reach wherever you're going after this <laughs> life. And so it, it's a voluntary thing. Yeah. And we must thank them because some of them are doing great yeah. work. Yeah. Some of them are really managing properly. Yeah. Uh, I don't want to say it. Uh, I'm a male, but I find that females, they usually manage better than the males. Mm -hmm. in we these agree. Water system. So, <laughs> we, we, we have I few don't males think we'll argue with you here no. about that. We have few <laughs> males that do an excellent job as well, but yeah. majority are females who do yeah. excellent job at manage, yeah. managing yeah. these systems. So let's not neglect to leave the almost 20 communities that you pointed out yes. who do not have access. What are the plans in place to ensure, well, uh, who don't have a stable access, I should say, right? Um, it's not a stable as, it's not not having have, access. It's improving it's not their, having yeah. a water system. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because there, we, we ensure that there's an improved source. So an improved source, as I said, could be a hand pump. Yeah. Because what you had before, you had to walk five miles to get water, and now we put a hand pump for 10 families. Yeah. So we, we do have, they do have access. Yeah. But the thing is, a water system. Yeah. So what's the plan to be able to address uh, these 20, about 20 communities uh, yes, about who... 20. There, there are, there are, the relationship with the ministry and SIF okay. is important. SIF yeah. receives the funding through, uh, from um, our, our donor partners, Basic mm -hmm. Needs Trust Fund and mm -hmm. CDB. Mm -hmm. um, and then those we prioritize from those communities um, mm -hmm. based on, on uh, population on urgency and so there's a list of things that that mr banner and his team mm -hmm. will do their research along with the SIF team to let us know on the priority list on the list which communities um are ought to be selected in whatever round of projects we're yeah. doing through SIF. um and so we in in terms of a timeline mm -hmm. we want to make sure that in the next by the next five in the next five years within the next five years all these communities in yeah. some way have an improved water source. We either yeah. improve the, the rehabilitation of the system that they have mm -hmm. or we uh, provide a better system yeah. than, than they currently have. Um, in the interim, those that aren't able to get the funding support mm -hmm. um, from SIF, government then provides through our budget. Um, mm -hmm. In the case of in this year, um, we have the three that are being funded we by SAFE, four, Quique Hute, the Quique Hute, Boston, Boston Bullet Tree, and Libertad, Libertad San Jose, and Bullet Tree so five. The fives. And then the other one, like Sarawi, um, and Armenia, and even Unitedville, yes. where, and uh, now we're talking about Mullins River. Yes. We are trying to get source, uh, funding from Ministry of Finance to supplement our budget to help mm -hmm. put in place systems in these mm -hmm. communities. We're quickly up running out of time, and I don't want to, I feel like we're neglecting such an important um, part of this conversation, which is looking at the current uh, impacts of climate change and planning for the mitigation um, of the effects of, of climate change. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, there was a drought that was affecting the agriculture sector in the north. Mm -hmm. And each year, I think anecdotally, people talk of the differences they see in weather patterns. Mm -hmm. uh, from your perspective, where you know there a little less than half of, of our country that relies on natural sources. Uh, what are we doing in, in planning for the effects of climate change and reducing those effects? Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's a, there are m many different things that we have to think yeah. about when we think of climate change and it affects its effect on water supply. Yeah. Um, we have conversations where people are uh, reporting that there is no salt water intrusion mm -hmm. in certain communities and how we deal with that. Mm -hmm. um, our approach, at least, and our thinking in, in that's manifested in a lot of the activities that we do is one, educating people on, on harvesting rainwater where mm -hmm. we right now are tapping into our groundwater source and yeah. that has been our primary source of supplying water to communities yeah. but there is a lot of rainwater available during the rainy season yeah. so we know that in communities there are some communities that practice very good conservation um, mm -hmm. um, activities in capturing rainwater but there's definitely um, a, a, an opportunity for mm -hmm. us to look at conserving and capturing more rainwater to have and store in these communities in the event that there is um, there is a drought, for mm -hmm. example, a, a large scale or small scale drought in any part. And so we have to take the approach by regions. There are more some regions of the country that are drier than others. Mm -hmm. um, certain activities we can we can replicate in certain communities like the rainwater water harvesting. That's one. Two, going back to old time practices. Right. Old, that's one of them. Mm -hmm. Two, working more on, um, and this is a lot with the regulatory agencies, but land use practices. Um, we, the contamination of our water source with the activities or by the activities mm -hmm. that are happening um, on land is getting even more um, alarming for communities. And mm -hmm. so when in times of heavy rains, even though there may be a lot of water, the quality of the water becomes an issue. So adapting new practices of treating water mm -hmm. at the source is important. Treating it when it gets to your yeah. home is important. Um, we, we, as in, in communities, um, they would be the first responders to any any impacts from climate change. So they're the ones who will have to be at the front lines yeah. tackling the issue of, of, of water scarcity, mm -hmm. um, floods, contamination of water from heavy rains, from drought events, those kinds of things. So we have to do a better job um, in our ministry, working with our partners in the Red Cross, mm -hmm. in NEMO, to have in place these response mechanisms that allow our communities, the village leaders, the water board leaders, mm -hmm. um, the activists in these communities to um, be a bit more responsive to these kinds of activities from climate change. Right. We, 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 have, we have one of those pilot projects in Freetong Sabun. Mm -hmm. We did uh, rainwater harvesting, so we, we provided vats. If your roof is not good, we provided some kind of catchment area so you could capture rainwater for ho household use and then the river is nearby so you can use the river water to do other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we are trying these and we are piloting different uh, methods of making use of the, the water that is available yeah. as we go along. Right. One of the last things I want to just mention, because I did a lot of research on this in my thesis, is that of our transboundary systems. Yeah. We, in terms of water security, um, we share yeah. water with our neighbors. We get the last drop, literally. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they, so they have first, first use. Mm -hmm. um, and so there has to be the conversation mm -hmm. on how we then um, participate in the decision for water use that first is used by Mexico, Guatemala, and then in mm -hmm. Belize. Uh, we have a very good relationship with the, Mex with the Mexican um, Water Commission mm -hmm. um, and have been um, working along with them in cooperation exercise along the, in the Hondo River. Um, we've been working with them at a technical level in measuring and monitoring water quality mm -hmm. um, in that river. But it has to go beyond that. Yeah. It has to go... And the relationship with, with, the Gua with Guatemala? It's more at the local level, yeah. um, with the communities along in those areas, and also with the NGO partners, yeah. FCD um, especially. Yeah. Um, uh, and to some degree, um, there were or there has been a lot of effort pumped into the MAR Fund initiative, the Mesoamerican Reef Mm -hmm. fund initiative of which Belize is a founding member through PACT um, and so they have in the last 10 years focused their efforts on watershed management mm -hmm. um, in Guatemala, in Mexico, in Belize because 
the activities in these countries that, that happens on land affect or water systems, it affects the reef. There's also partnerships with the World Wildlife Fund mm -hmm. um, for watershed management in Guatemala and Honduras again at, uh, uh, with local NGOs, WWF and government agencies in these yeah. countries. So there are activities, there are things happening in terms of management of watersheds mm -hmm. um, and shared water resources. But for Belize, there has to be a conscious effort now taken at the political level mm -hmm. to address the issue of water security, especially in non-transponder watersheds. All right. Well, thank you for coming in and giving us a full update as to some of the work that you've been doing. Uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we'll be joined by Leroy Green, who's authored a new handbook for teachers. Stay tuned.